Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by eMinutes. Are you a first-time entrepreneur looking to incorporate? eMinutes will form your corporation for free. Go to eMinutes.com for more details. And by Igloo, an intranet you'll actually like. Visit igloosoftware.com slash thisweekend for a chance to win an iPad mini. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. This is This Week in Startups. I'm holding a book, Startup Communities, by Brad Feld, entrepreneur, no, former entrepreneur, angel investor, venture capitalist, blogger, author, genius, one of my oldest friends in the industry. He's got, he's like, this is the guy, like, when he talks, I listen. And I listen. You guys know I never shut up. When Brad Feld talks, I listen. Jason Calacanis listens to Brad Feld. This is like one of my favorite people to have on the program. Stick with us. Hey, everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. You know what this program is about. It's about creating companies, startups, products, services that change the world, that put a dent in the universe. This show is not for people who want to pick rice. This show is for samurais who want to take those swords out and just maul and just crush it and kill and make awesome stuff in the world. If you are a pathetic loser who wants to sit on the bench for the rest of your life, please, by all means, switch channels. But... If you want to do something with your life, if you want to make something great, please subscribe to the channel on YouTube and listen to the program. Because what I do here is I find the most brilliant people in the world who have year after year, decade after decade, changed the world by either funding great companies or making great companies or building them on the boards of these companies. I have them on the program, and then I ask them very basic questions. How do you do it? How do you make it happen? How do you get through the hard times? What are the things that are most important for you to focus on when you're building this great company that's going to change the world? Today on the program, I have Brad Feld, who has essentially created the entire ecosystem in Boulder, has invested in countless companies, and is looked at as, you know, I, mean, I don't mean to make him feel old, but he's now like an elder statesman in the internet industry and in investing, and he's like one of those guys that I read his blog religiously. And when he talks, as I said in the cold open, I listen. And you're going to love this uh, interview and discussion we're going to have today because I'm going to learn a lot and you're going to learn a lot. Igloo software, yes, that's the internet you'll actually like. Built on social tools you already use. File sharing, shared folders, shared calendars, blogs, wikis, all with a secure business contact. Igloo is fully hosted and managed in the cloud. So you can focus on your work and not the IT budget. Here's how we use it. We keep track of all of our equipment here. Check out that nice wiki where we have all the equipment and how much we spent on it and how much is da, da, da. This is very good for us because I need to have all this information at my fingertip when I need it because then I can check it and I can yell at somebody for not doing their job. No, seriously, you need to have an intranet and great companies like IDC, Deloitte, NetApp, Kimberly-Clark, RCA, RS, RCA, I think RCA went out of business in 1947. It's RSA. I know those guys. Aetna Insurance. All these folks use Igloo software. It's a great intranet. Bring your team in from the cold by getting inside the Igloo. Yes, visit igloosoftware.com slash this weekend. And you will be entered into a drawing for an iPad mini. Yes, these guys are smart. Get a 30-day free trial and enter to win an iPad mini, which has become my preferred device. All right, let's get on with this interview. This is an amazing welcome, Brad Fell, to the program. How are you doing, pal? Good to see you, man. Good to see you. This is driving me crazy. So yeah, is it making you crazy? Have a little yeah. water there. I'm not crazy anymore, though. No. Um, you wrote a book, another book, Startup Communities, Building an Entrepreneurial Ecosystem in Your City. And you actually did this in Boulder. What's the secret? I mean, Boulder has, it, there's about 15, 50,000 people live in Boulder? 100,000 so? 100, people. There's 100,000 people, and every time I meet somebody there, as I said on my Twitter account the other week, and you retweeted, they're like a genius. Like it's, it's like I go out for Sunday brunch and, and when I'm in Boulder and the person's read the New York Times cover to cover, they've gone to yoga, they climbed a mountain, they went on a hike, and then they invested in three companies. <laughs> this is the most industrious area. But 20 years ago, not so much. Well, Boulder's, Boulder's got an interesting story in that it's, a, for me, it's been a small enough place where you can get your mind around it. 
but a big enough place where there's actually enough critical mass to do something interesting. Mm. And the entrepreneurial activity in Boulder way predates me moving there in 95. So I moved there in 95 um, with, uh, I moved there in 95 with my wife, Amy. Uh, we were living in Boston, had been in Boston 12 years. And when I sold my first company, I was 28. And I told her that by the time I turned 30, we'd move to Boulder. Hmm. Or we, I went, by the time I turned 30, we'd move. Right. And uh, two months before I turned 30, she told me she was moving to Boulder and I could come with her. So <laughs> Boulder was not a place I knew anything about. I knew one person and he moved away. So I literally just moved there to live. Hmm. And what I found when I moved there was this incredible concentration of really smart people. Right. And, you know, I have to say it's, <clears throat> it's a place where the hippies that were going from the East Coast to the West Coast ran out of gas. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, mountains, cool, let's stay here. Right. Um, but what, what's happened is over this long period of time, certainly starting before 1995, but continuing through, you've taken this sort of counterculture place with very, very smart people, um, this high concentration of independence. Mm. And on top of that, uh, a series of things that I call the Boulder Thesis that really are the essence of creating a startup community. Right. And it comes from my view that you can create a startup community in any city in the world. Any city could have one. Any city can have one. And everybody's and tried. Few have succeeded. Well, I actually go further than thinking that any city can have one. I think every city needs one. Absolutely. So yeah. if, if you think about what a city is, a city was once a startup. Right? Absolutely. Somebody yeah. showed up and said, we're going to have a city here. Yeah, Vegas. And Vegas, L.A., anything. Yeah. Boston. Right. Right. That I was mean, the ultimate some, one. Some dude bumped into a rock, right? I yeah. mean, it, it, uh, it's really the essence of how things start. So if you think about startups, startups are the uh, essence of sort of regenerating and creating newness right. within an existing infrastructure and ecosystem, whether it's the technology industry or a city uh, or a particular vertical market. Right. And it's also very generational, which is that a as people create new companies, those companies over time become the established companies. Ah. And those established companies constantly need new companies to challenge them. I mean, you right. joke about me being an old guy, right? I, right? I booted up version 47 of me recently. Right. And, you know, I hopefully have incorporated everything I've learned from all the previous versions. Right. But by the time you get to be 47 years old, you're not thinking about things the same you way. You could have retired at 28, 29, 30. Yep. You didn't. Why is that? I wasn't done. You weren't done. So that, that's that simple. You just not done. That simple. Uh, we actually. Wait, how do you know if you're done or you're not? I mean, how yeah. do you go through that? You just say like, I'm too young to stop, or I need more money. I mean, you obviously didn't. Was it just that you love the game so much? No, for me, I'm very motivated by learning, uh, and so uh, I like to talk about learning on a spectrum or uh, motivation on a spectrum from intrinsic to extrinsic. Okay. Right. So extrinsically motivated people. Hey, Jason, you're doing great. It's awesome. Wow. Yay. Look at how incredible this is. Here's an award. Right. Right. Here's more money. Look, your picture's in a magazine. That's all fine. That's one end of the spectrum. And it works pretty well when you're in your 20s. It, it works well when you're in your 20s and it works well for a lot of personalities. Right. And a lot of people stay on that curve forever. For me, um, I was always, as long as I was learning something, as long as I was in a moment where whatever that experience I had, I was getting something new out of it, that was motivating to me. Mm. And after I'd sold my first company, when I was 28, I started making angel investments. Mm. And what I found was that even in my first company, which was self-funded, we didn't raise any money, we grew it to a couple million dollars before we sold it, I'd learned an enormous amount, but I was nowhere near saturation mm. in terms of learning uh, about business and creating companies and entrepreneurships. I was nowhere done learning about technology and how technology impacted right. humans. I was completely fascinated by the social dynamics of trying to do this stuff. So I had a long way to go. And you were retired. At, you could basically have retired in 95, which, by the way, was when the starter pistol went off for the Internet. That's right. So what happened? Interesting timing. Yeah, my timing was, you know, my timing was good in some ways. I mean, uh, you know, I'd, I'd sold this company in 1993. Mm -hmm. I started making angel investments in 94. Right. Uh, I helped start a venture capital fund in 97. I think that's when we met, 96, 97 met or probably, something. You know, 95, 96, that yeah. time frame. Because I was spending a lot of time, you know, I didn't move out of Boston until 95. I made investments in New York as well as Boston. And I spent time on the West Coast. Uh, in the Bay Area and L.A. and Seattle. Yep. So I had a bunch of these, you know, twenty five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 angel investments I made. I made about 40 of them in that three-year time period. Um, but what was so fascinating about it was that was an arc that was a very positive arc, but that arc peaked. Yeah. That arc peaked pretty aggressively in 2001. And it came down pretty aggressively in 2000, right. 2001. And so, yeah. you know, everybody had, uh, anybody who was involved in software and Internet in that time frame had 
you know, a year, just one year that was awful. And yeah. you know, my year was uh, 2001. And how bad was it? Well, in 2001, I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples of bad. Yeah. Um, I was involved in, I was probably on 20 something boards at that point, which was 20. Way, way too many boards for. That's what, eight more than you should be on? I don't know what the right number is, but it was too many. Mm -hmm. I had about 10 companies in 2001 that shut down. 10. So, 10. So about one a month. Um, oh. You know, you just can't avoid it, right? I mean, you're, you're, wherever you look, something is messed up. Uh, I was... It's like triage, like being on the beach in Normandy. Not to make light of being on the beach yeah, in Normandy, but just people are getting blown up all around you. So, so the, the best way to describe it is, you know how you have, you know, you just have a terrible, terrible day. Like, yeah. Awful day. You go home at the end of the day, and... Amy's there. Well, Amy for me. Yeah, Jade for me, right? Jade for you. Yeah, get home. And you, you get home, and you do whatever you do to relax, right? You, yeah, you, you try. You, you go you for try. a run, you smoke a dub, you have a drink, right. whatever, and read you, a book. And you, and you hang out, and you're like, all right, tomorrow's going to... I'm going to go to sleep. Tomorrow's going to be better. A brand new day. Okay. So by July of 2001, I woke up, and I realized every day had been worse than the previous day. <laughs> so It's so, not getting better. Okay. So what happened was, was something that happens a lot as an entrepreneur that you have to do. At some point, you have to accept the reality of what's going on. And so in that moment, in the middle of the year, I said, you know what? It's just going to be really crappy for a long time. You have to define reality. And, and I'm going to look forward, and I'm going to say, all right, let's see what they can bring at me. Huh. And so instead of fighting it, like, it's, it's, it's got to get better. I can't deal with this. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to deal with it. It's just going to yep. be whatever it is. And then what happened was eventually you get through it. Uh, and it takes time. And by, you know, 2000, uh, 2002 was not a great year for me, but it was right. not a terrible year for me. It right. was a terrible year for a lot of other people. Right. And 2003, 2004 were hard years, but some really interesting things. Value was being created. Started to happen. And, yeah. Oh, by the way, a bunch of companies in 1999 and 2000, we were early investors in Postini, which was a company started in sure. 1999. You know, by 2003, Postini is a really important company. Wow. And so some of it so is not some that... Some people who made it through... Every, it's not that everything gets wiped out. Right. It's that a whole bunch of stuff does, but there's value and there's persistence that entrepreneurs can play through. Did you think of giving up during that period? I mean, it's got to be trying every day. A different company, your reputation's on the line. Do you have that self-doubt? Like, my God, I made all these bets. I invested all this money, and it's all coming apart at the seams. You ever think, enough, I'll just I, retire. I, I had multiple points of, of real distress. Um, one was I was uh, on four public company boards. Hang on a second. It's the, dawn, it's, a, it's the Imperial March. <laughs> hey, sweetie, how are you? <laughs> it's the wife. This is the first yeah, live phone I'm, call. Uh, I'm, I'm doing this thing with Jason Calacanis. It's live on the air. Yeah. He's taking, you know, listen, this is priorities. Yeah, yeah. No, we're doing a live taping of a TV show thing. Yeah, internet TV. The internet TV show. Internet TV show. This week in startups. Okay. I yep. love you. See ya. All right. Okay. So, so anyway, that's, that, that's, you know, that's your... entrepreneur rule number one, by the way. It is uh, family first. Not even family first. If, 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 you're, if your partner, significant other calls you, no matter what you're doing, answer. Answer. Amy and I have been doing this for as long as I've had a cell phone. That's very sweet. It, now, but can I ask, is that ringtone specifically for your wife? The Darth Vader her, theme? That is her ringtone. But, but even, <laughs> even better, that is hers and only hers. She chose it. Oh, I like that. And, 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 and she will say to me sometimes, this is the Dark Lord of the Sith call. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. So, so, so in this time period... The, the worst, I'm, the worst right. moment, yes. Well, there are a couple worst moments. Here's one. I'm on, the, I'm on four public company boards. Star Media is one, I think. No, I wasn't on no? Star Media. Okay. I was on uh, uh, People PC. Oh, my goodness. I uh, love that company. Raindance, uh, Inner Lion, yeah. which I'd co-founded, and Message Media, which I'd also sure. co-founded. At one point in time, if you multiplied their share prices together, you got a smaller number. And for the mathematicians, that means that all of those stocks... See, this is my normal ringtone. I won't answer Yeah, this. turn that one off. Okay. Um, all of those stocks were sub-dollar. So every single public company board I was on was less than a dollar. Which means it... Wow. Okay, so I spent all my time like talking about reverse stock splits and NASDAQ compliance and oh my God, pink sheets and, and running out of. Okay, so that and was, the lawsuits are piling up. The lawsuits are piling up. Here's another terrible moment. I'm chair, I'm co-founder of a company that went public in 1999. Peak market cap was about two and a half billion dollars. Hmm. We built a company that did about uh, 200 million dollars revenue in its best year. We mastered the art of losing five million dollars a month. Wow. We were extraordinary at it. I mean, really, really good at it. 
And we raised a debt financing in March 2001 that was supposed to convert into equity. Right. Uh, is it one of these deals that Merrill Lynch did. Yeah. It never converted into equity because the stock price went down, never Flipped converted. underwater. So we have $160 million of debt. We are losing $5 million a month. Eventually, we have to pay the debt back, but we don't have any operating capital to do it. And there's right. no financing markets because now we're into 2002. Right. This company goes bankrupt after, at the peak, being worth $2.5 billion. Oh, my God. None of the founders took any money out, me oh. included. And then after we went bankrupt and went through the whole bankruptcy process, sold off the assets, done, signed the little pieces of paper saying we're done. Right. We got sued. We lost everything. We got sued for the DNO insurance. Oh, my God. And, you know, that went on for another three years. Oh. And at the end of that, it settled for uh, $600,000. They sued us for $150 million. They spent $3 million to get 600000 So it was a bad trade on their part. Um, but it was just one of these things where you wake up every day and you think about it. Oh. And so it's sort of this thing over you. Yeah. But at the same time, you have all this other stuff you're doing. So you right. have to concentrate and have to continue to get up each day and, and, and focus on moving things fight. forward. And now everything's going so well. Every, the market's open up again. Although now I guess we've had a little bit of uncertainty. Who knows yeah. what's going on right now? But uh, you mentioned that you're bold with these. So let's get back to that. Uh, we know you're not going to give up when things go bad. That's checked off in the box. But the bolder thesis, what is it? So there's four elements. If you want to build a startup community yeah. anywhere, there's four principles that you have to follow. Okay. The first is that the leaders have to be entrepreneurs. The leaders have to be Okay, makes sense. So I separate the world <clears throat> of a startup community into leaders and feeders. <clears throat> and both leaders and feeders are important, but they're totally different. What's a feeder? A feeder like is a lawyer? university, ah. uh, government, Got it. lawyers, uh, investors, venture capitalists, angel right. investors, um, big companies that want to be involved in the startup ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem. You can have individual members of the feeders provide leadership, right. but the leaders, the institutions, the hierarchies can't do it. Right. Because the startup community is this giant, messy network of entrepreneurs and you have to have a critical mass of entrepreneurs who are going to play a leadership role. Mm. That's thing number one. Thing number two is that they have to take a 20 plus year view, a long term view to this. People thinking that stuff happens in a year or two or three, it's delusional. Right. Right. You know, yeah, every now and then companies are overnight successes in a year or two. Right. But most things take five, 10, 15, 20 years to do. Right. right. I mean, you know, you just keep banging away and banging away and all of a sudden you have success, right? The overnight success that was 15 years in the making. Absolutely. And you go down the list of companies, iRobot, Harmonix. I mean, these, you know, companies that either friends of mine started or I've been involved in over the years, 15 years later, they became successful. Right. Um, third is that you have to be inclusive of anyone who wants to engage in any way in right. the startup community. So in Boulder, uh, we do this thing where basically anyone who wants to get involved at any level is welcome. We throw the doors open. If somebody wants to come to Boulder and check things out, just email brad at feld.com. I may not have time to meet with you, but I'll introduce you to a bunch of other people. And right. It'll be very easy for you and to I've get And I've done this with you. In. I said, hey, I got some developers. Some of my developers wanted to move to Boulder. I sent them there. I sent them to you guys. You were incredibly graceful. You sent them to send 10 CEOs. That's right. And they're integrated to the system. And the, the, view, the view simply is it's not a zero-sum game. Right? It's not you win, I lose. It's right. like more of this is better. Let's just right. get more of this going. Um, there's another part of that which is really important, which is this notion of uh, give before you get. Uh -huh. So this idea that... I want to be helpful without an expectation of what I get back. Altruism, and yeah. It's not altruism. It's, it's essentially the definition. I'm, ver I'm very selfish in that I right. want to get something back. I just don't know what it is. So I'm not ah, going to say, and when. hey, Jason. So it's less transactional. That's right. Hey, Jason, you know, I will come on your show if you give me this. Right. I, you're like, no. that. What's no. that? I'll say, look, I'm happy to do it. Like, right. I like you. I care about you. You care about me. That's good. Right. Let me be helpful. And if that's good, that's good for you. It's good for me. Keep going. Right. Think about the difference between an advisor and a mentor. Right. An advisor says, hey, look, if you give me 1% of your company, I'll help you. Right. A mentor says, how can I be helpful to you? Right. So it's that kind of an uh, uh, idea in this construct. And then the fourth is that you have to have activities and events that engage everyone in the entrepreneurial stack, from aspiring entrepreneur to first-time entrepreneur to multi-time entrepreneur to investors, to lawyers, to accountants, to people in the university, to government, to anybody that wants to participate. And this is not cocktail parties. This is not, you know, going to some rich person's house and hanging out and doing something. This is not the entrepreneur of the year thing where you get a plaque. Those things are fine, but they're not really fundamental. It's stuff like Techstars and yeah. an accelerator that for 90 days is focused on 
helping these 10 companies and these 30 or so entrepreneurs get from start of their company to launch or mm -hmm. startup weekend, which is, you know, 54 hours of entrepreneurship. Yep. It's a simulation, low stakes overall, but incredibly intense dynamics and very, very interesting things come out of it. But if you want to understand how entrepreneurship works, that's a great way to do it. Right. If you're an existing entrepreneur and you're looking to hire people, that's a great place to go hang out and participate right. to find some great people. So those are the kinds of things. Any one of them is not enough. Right. You have to have 20, 30 of these things going on at you any know, given you time. You were kind of alone when you started this in Boulder. There wasn't that many people there. Well, but... in Boulder in 95 when I moved there, um, I again, I didn't know anybody. Hmm. There were probably a dozen entrepreneurs who I can look back 15 years later and say they were playing leadership roles mm. in the startup community as it existed in 1995. Today, there's probably 100, mm. right? So, and it's not that there's 100 entrepreneurs in Boulder. There's probably 1,000 entrepreneurs in Boulder. Mm. And, you know, 100,000 people, there's probably five to 10,000 people that are linked directly to the startup community in some way. So this incredible concentration of activity. But it wasn't that I showed up and magic happened. It was that there were a set of people that all of a sudden started talking to each other and went on a journey together to create something substantive over a long period how of time. How many companies have you invested in now? How many, how many founders, companies? So as an, as an angel investor, I probably made 100 plus investments. Over 20 years. Yeah, over in, in really mostly in two periods of time, 94 to 96 and 2006 to 2007. So 97 to 2005, I did most of my investing through Mobius. Mm -hmm. And then 2007 forward, I've done most of my investing through Foundry. Right. Foundry is um, your venture Foundry capital. Foundry Group, which yeah. is venture capital group that I'm one of the four partners in. Um, so the angel investing activity is about 100. Uh, venture investing uh Directly, I probably made another 100 investments. Indirectly, probably four or 500 between the different funds. Foundry has, <clears throat> we have about 60 companies that we've wow. invested in since 90, uh, 2007. Mobius might have invested in three, 400. And then I'm an investor in a bunch of venture funds. So I've been very active. Uh, you're an LP. A I'm an LP. Partner in a bunch of and so places. I invest, and I like to invest, I've been very systematic about investing in first-time funds. Ah, um, what's and the trying, thesis there? My thesis there is, um, the, if you look at history, hmm. many of the really successful uh, venture investing activity comes from smaller funds, right. as well as from first-time funds before they start adding on Hungry? lots of capital. Hungry, less capital, efficiency. underwork, more efficiency around it. Interesting. And I also am a very big believer of putting a small amount of money into lots of things that help stoke the ecosystem. Got it. And so it's a way for me with each of these individual investments. They're not huge. I'm not a huge investor in any right. of these funds, but by being a small investor, I can help those uh, uh, VCs who are starting mm -hmm. off their new fund in whatever way I can be useful to them. And it's a way of having a stake in it. And then the last, of course, in terms of the investments is Techstars, which is now right. 200 and something companies we've done through Techstars. All right, when we get back, you can think about this during uh, my little commercial break. I want you to think about, and then explain to the audience, what, were the, what are the key things that when an entrepreneur comes in, make you, the two or three things, make you absolutely fall in love with them so much that you cut that check, that very important first angel check. And I'm sure you've done it on the spot, said I will yep. invest on the spot. And what was the shortest amount of time before you knew you would invest in something? One minute. One minute. So we're going to hear that story when we get back from commercial break. And we couldn't have done this without our friends over at E-Minutes. Yes, they're the law firm with 20 years of service to the biggest names in sports, music, and film. And they're embarking on a mission. They want to form 500 free corporations for the first time ever, free for entrepreneurs. I know a lot of people have taken advantage of this and saved thousands of dollars. And they're almost done. They've done 350 of them. they got 150 left. So if you're starting a new company and you want to be incorporated for free, including the filing fees, which, hey, but that's a couple hundred bucks, two or three hundred bucks in my experience, you can do it for free with at eminutes. Go to eminutes.com. And they have a new service, and this is a great one, which is called Entity Management. If you don't know what that is, when you create an entity like an LLC or a corporation, an S-Corp, C-Corp, whatever, Delaware Corp, you need to handle the uh, minutes and the, and the Secretary of State filings, all that stuff that give you peace of mind associated with maintaining a company. Because if you don't do it, then you can get all kinds of penalties. Ugh, it's a whole bunch of problems. And they do it for only $135 a year. It's a fantastic price. And I'm going to actually switch my companies over to that because they didn't even have that service when I um, had uh, other people managing ours. And boy, we're paying uh, through the nose for that. Thank you so much to at e for sponsoring this very program. 
Over 10,000 people have enrolled in their uh, new tool, the Entity Management Tool, which is absolutely fantastic. You're going to want to really um, take care of that uh, for your corporation. Entity Management, very important. Go ahead and thank at eMinutes on your Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Plus, Rise, LinkedIn, Six Degrees, or other social network, Bebo, if you're rocking the Bebo. Anyway, listen, thank you at eMinutes, and let's get back to this very exciting interview. Hundreds of companies you've been involved in investing in directly, thousands indirectly, let's say, or another bunch of hundreds with through these, all these different funds that you invested in. What is it that makes you want to instantly invest in something? What is it that you see? Because you, you must have some filter now, right? You must have, and you tell people what that filter is? Or, I mean, it might be a little dangerous for you to say what it is. People start gaming it, but give me an idea. Yeah, so we're, I'm actually really explicit about what the filter is. Okay. Um, and if you go to foundrygroup.com slash themes, mm. what you'll see are a half a dozen or so themes of ours. Um, the way we think about what we invest in at Foundry is we invest in the U.S. Okay. We also invest in Canada. We like to call Canada Northern United States. So U.S. and Canada only. U.S. and Canada only. We're early investors, but we don't have to be the first money in the company. Got it. So if you've raised more than three million bucks, you're too late for us. Got it. Might be an exception every now and then, but that's typical. Case. Why is that? Why is that you have to be the first in? It's having invested. We don't have to be the first. Oh, I'm sorry. Be, well, be that's early. Be we early. just want to be early. Be early. We are not mid-stage investors. I've done it, and my partners have done it, and it's just not comfortable to us. Got it. Like getting involved in the company at a sort of later stage when there's a bunch of other VCs involved, it's not our thing. We describe ourselves also, by the way, as syndication agnostic, so we're mm. happy to invest by ourselves. We're also happy to invest with another VC, mm. sometimes with two, but we don't want a whole bunch of other people involved in the company. It's, too, it. it's not our thing. Right. Um, and this comes from some sort of pattern recognition. You've seen just, the movie before. Just experience and yeah. what we like and what we don't like. Got so uh, some of it is our own, you know, it's, it's not a judgment on the companies. Mm. It's much more of, you know, I'll cycle all the way back to this in a sec, is what we're interested in investing in. Got it. Then, assuming that you're in the U.S. or Canada, you've raised less than $3 million, we then focus on, are you in one of these themes, yes or no? Mm. And our themes are pretty abstract. They're not stuff like video and mobile. Adhesive. Adhesive, human-computer interaction. Digital life, distribution glue, human-computer interaction protocol. Interesting. Okay, so we define them as these broad horizontal things. It's mm -hmm. not consumer web. It's not video. Mm. And we use these definitions as a negative filter, these themes as a negative filter. So if you don't fit in a theme, we don't engage. Wow. If you do fit in a theme, then we go incredibly deep on two things, people and product. Got it. Okay, so hold that thought. If I cycle back to what I started, where I started as an angel investor, the things that turned me on were really simple. I got excited about people mm. who were super obsessed about a product. That's it. Like, if I liked you and wanted to work with you as a person and you wanted to work with me, right. and you were completely obsessed with a product, right. and I understood or cared about or had some kind of attachment to the product, I'd invest. Interesting. That, that was how I behaved as an angel. I didn't care about total available market. I didn't care about what your background was. I didn't care where you went to school. The deck. No. Nah. Were you somebody I wanted to work with? Got it. And did you want to work with me? Bi-directional. Sure. And is the thing that you're working on something that you're completely on fire obsessed about? Right. And what's happened as a venture firm, what we found is we've really moved to that same model. Mm. So because of these themes... We know the markets that we're investing in really well. We know the competitive dynamics. We know the business model. We know how to... A lot to of entrepreneurs make that mistake. They come in and try to explain to a very savvy investor, venture capitalist, angel, whatever, why Pinterest sucks, why Zynga, or Facebook are broken, and how they're going to fix it. And it, it it's, everything is about how bad the most successful things in the world are. And that you're saying that to somebody who gets pitched 10, 20, 30 yeah. times a week. It's, it's madness. Such, such a powerful insight. I don't care about that at all. Right. All I care about is what you're going to do with the idea or the thing or the product or the place you're going to take it. Right. I don't really care about how it lines up against other stuff. Right. Yeah, I'm happy to have that conversation to understand how you're different and why you think that there's an advantage here. That's part of the conversation, but that's not a lead. Right. The, and people lead with that. All the time. It's crazy. I had somebody right. come in and tell me how... Well, 
effed up Pinterest was. I was with somebody earlier today that showed me uh, a product, and they'd done a lot of work on me, and, and I, they'd actually, we'd had an interaction before. I actually bought their product, Okay. Uh, and I liked the product. Oh, that's a good and start. And I went and I met with them. Um, and it's, uh, mm. uh, it's, a, it's a really, really, really clever product. And I walked in, and the first thing they did was show me the product. That's it. That's it. Like, done. Let's play with the product. Let's play with our next product. Let me show you where it's going. Let's talk about, you know, Let's what, we're, what we're dealing with here. It's and all then, on the plate. Then you get a feeling for the person, how they think about the product, and how they relate to the product. That's what matters. And, and what are you looking for in terms of, okay, so product obsessed, obviously, here is, is the theme. Well, th- th- does a person need to be a developer? Does a person need to be a designer? Does a person need no. to be... It doesn't matter. No. Just that they understand I, it? I, I've learned both from, my, from all the different categories, angel investing, from venture investing, and from tech stars. The best teams are teams that are two to four people, founding teams, mm-hmm. two to four people, product-centric. Yeah. So 50% of the people are focused on product. They could be designer, developer, coder, mm. CTO, engineer, whatever, but they have a, their entire focus is on product. And 50% or less are focused on the business. So optimal teams, mm. kind of three people, Got it. right? Two product people and one not product person. Interesting. All three of them passionate, engaged, focused on the product. Right. But one person whose job it is to move the business forward. Got it. One person whose job it is to build the product. Mm. And another person whose job it is to do something around the product, which very often is an interface between the product and the customer. Yeah, the design, the marketing, it's the synthesis strategy. of it. Interesting. Right. And so this is the very nascent teams, right? The very small founding and teams. And that's what you get excited about when you see that little yeah, like, I mean, uh, sing- one room. Si- single founder, super hard. Yeah. Too many people sitting around the table early on, hard. Three business guys, one product guy. Disaster. Uh, basically, the three business guys tell the product guy what to do all day. The product guy doesn't have any time to do anything, so everybody bitches about how nothing ever gets done. Right. Right? It's like... It, yeah, you're changing gears. And there's nothing for the three product guys to, or the three business guys to do until the product guy does except, the product anyway. Except, except complain. Except distract them. Right. So you've got that, that dynamic plays out as well. So that's a red flag right there. Too, Too many business people, not enough product people is a red flag. Interestingly, you could take... If you have a team of four and three people are business people and one person's a product people, right. just repurpose one of the business people to make them product people. Right. Some of the best PMs, some of the best product managers are not technical, right. but they're very organized, mm. right? They're good thinkers. So you got to tell them, listen, you could be this position on the basketball team, but we don't need that. We don't need three people to shoot the ball. Right. So just grab some goddamn rebounds. That's right. Uh, maybe set a pick or something exactly like right. that. Mark Pincus, Zynga, one of your investments. Mm-hmm. Tremendous entrepreneur. Did you invest in his first company, Free Letter 2, or just Fred Wilson? Uh, Fred invested, SoftBank invested, so I was right. linked to SoftBank at the right. time, but I wasn't directly invested. Right. So you've known him for and then decades. And then we were investors <coughs> We were investors in SupportSoft. Oh. And then we didn't invest in Tribe, and I'm not entirely sure why. I don't remember the... I don't, there's, yeah. there's some narrative around it that I don't remember. Yeah. But, uh, but I've, so known, I've known Mark since the mid-90s. He has gotten crushed recently in the press. We've both been friends with him for a while. Um, and he's going through hard times, but he obviously built that company into a juggernaut. What, what's he like? What is he at his core? Well, so Mark is an incredibly, incredibly intense person mm. that is really, really focused on product, right. really focused on winning, mm. and really focused on continually getting better. Right. And he has had to go through his own personal journey, right. having never been the leader of a very large company before. Right. right. Each of the companies that he'd been involved in were either modest by the time that he was no longer leading or yeah. got bought early like Freeloader. Yeah, things got so, went public, got bought. He's that's had right. a tremendous and track record. It's very challenging, um, the internal dynamic and the external dynamic. The internal dynamic is one that nobody really sees and understands. Right. The external dynamic is a classic media arc. Right. And the classic media arc is... Uh, from obscurity to hero to go to, yeah. you know, crash and burn to reemerge right. to hero to, oh, he's a hero again. I got to tear right. him down again. So this curve goes on. Right. And the curve is actually independent and disconnected. From the reality. From the reality and functioning of a company. But when you become very public, mm. both as an entrepreneur or a person right. and as a company, right. it, no matter how good you are at turning it off and ignoring it, mm. you still can't turn it all off. I have to say, you know, I've known him like you for so long, and it, it just breaks my heart to see him being spun into something he's not, that I know he's not. He's such a great guy. He cares about people so much. He works so hard, and, and people have just been so down on him. I, I Immediately when the stock went down, I bought shares because they said, I, I'll, I'll bet on Mark Pincus every day of the, of the week. 
I mean, the guy is the hardest working, you know, greatest guy ever, and it's just hard to see. It's got to be yeah. hard as an investor for you to see that. Uh, it's hard. It's I'd say it's hard, and it's not. I mean, I I I uh, I haven't been on the the Zynga board since prior to the IPO. So right. I have within Foundry, we decided early on we weren't going to be public on public boards, right. and that came from my experience before, where I was spending this enormous amount of time on public boards. A lot boards. of work, yeah. Well, and this and you're better at the early stuff. This comes back to what I like. I don't right. like it. I don't enjoy that work. I right. like the I like. Like the, the the early stage so you have of the art. Be arc. true to yourself. Yeah. yeah, and that and I think one of the things that we've decided as a fund and as a firm is we were going to focus on the things we wanted to do yeah. and where we wanted to play. So there's parts of it that are hard, but it's also part of the experience of life. Right. Right. So you know I you know I have a lot of um, you know sort of personal uh, uh, loyalty, confidence, adoration to Mark. Right. And my belief is that with all the ups and downs that anybody goes through, him, yeah. me, you, whomever, if you really tr focusing on yourself in terms of becoming better and the people around you about doing something impactful right. over a period of time, you know, that will improve your life experience. And I think he's on that trajectory. And so he's on there. It's clearly, um, he's fighting the good fight and I, I think it's all going to work out. As an entrepreneur, how do you get through that? I mean, what are the devices or the techniques? Because you obviously, as a VC, I mean, what percentage of your role is funding, giving advice, or being essentially a coach slash therapist? I mean, yeah, I think a lot of it is. I think there's a uh, there's two things that people get uh, entrepreneurs get tangled up in in the context of perceiving how VCs spend their time. Yeah, um, one is to recognize that there's not a single archetype. Mm. So I, I like to think of VCs as Dungeons and Dragons characters or Got Magic it. the Gathering cards, right? So you could be dwarf, you could be you could elf, be a, you could be a ranger. That's right. You have, and, and you think about it, you think about the VCs you've met. They have different skill sets. They have different strengths. They have different mm. personality types. And then they have different experience points and different right. levels and different tricks and ah, whatever, I see. right? Yeah. So it's not that they're a single archetype on a certain curve. It's a bunch of different things. Mm. Oh, by the way, firms are often collections of different types of characters. Ah, so it's a great... Uh, pack. What did they call them when you had a group in uh, Dungeons and Dragons? I can't remember. I that. can't remember. There was something like your cohort was something. I, you know, I can't remember. Anyway, you I go. Played, I played a lot of it. Yes. The word, okay, is, the word is, eludes me. We got four sided die. Go. Um, and so thing number one is there's multiple archetypes. Okay. Thing number two is many venture capitalists, um, A, either don't work that hard. That's true. Okay. Or spend a lot of their time on things that are relatively low impact. Hmm. And so in my experience, the venture capitalists that I've, I've gotten to know over the years that I think are extraordinary mm. are ones who actually work incredibly hard and focus on trying to get rid of as much noise as they can, minimize the bureaucracy, minimize the overhead, ah. spend the least amount of time on things that they don't want to do, mm. right? So you say, well, Brad, is it useful for you to come on Jason's show? Right. Well, the answer is I want to. Right. It's interesting to me. Right. Just answering your questions. You, you, you ask me questions that are questions I haven't had to answer before. Right. It causes me to think about things. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Right. So clarifying you can, thinking. You can, you can decide what those different things are and useful. Why is writing a book useful? Mm. Right. Well, I will tell you that the book that we wrote, Venture Deals, that Jason right. and I wrote, had incredible impact on many, many entrepreneurs and has been very valuable to us as a firm. I'm sure it in resulted in some great back. deal flow or people saying into coming into a meeting saying, I read your book. Fascinating conversations. And I yes. think very powerful in terms of the overall arc. So I think the, the VCs that decide that they're going to work hard, now you come down to this issue of the, the front end of the deal finding part of the mm -hmm. process, not that significant. Okay, hmm. we, we invest at Foundry Group, we invest in 10, investments, 10 new investments a year. There's four of us. Right. We do 10, maybe 12 new investments a year. One every two or three week, months. Eh, well, let's say one a month. No, I'm saying for each partner. Yeah. We see on an annual basis, there's 100 companies that we want to invest in. Wow. There's 1,000 companies that we spend time with that fit in our themes. Holy cow. Okay. So it's not that we have to invest in a high percentage of the things that we interact with. We have to find 10 a year that we really, really, really want to work with. And is that the important process? Is the finding? For us, no. Yeah. The finding is, is table stakes. If you're not yeah. good at finding, you're not going to make any progress. Right. But you find many of these things that we invest in are very nascent. Mm. You know, how can you tell whether a company is going to accelerate like SendGrid did right. and become this incredibly impactful, very broad company? Great company. Or, out of Boulder. Yeah. Out of Boulder. Out of Techstars. Or, you know, a company like AdMeld, which when yeah. we made the investment in AdMeld, it was two guys. It was Ben and Brian, literally two guys with an idea with an ad ops background. Right. How, how would you know that that would end up being, you know, $400 million sale to Google? 
um, you don't really know that. What you know is you have these two guys that Go are really focused now, yeah. on their business. On They're their really product. obsessed about their product. They have a lot of expertise in an area. And then you spend a lot of time with them mm. helping build the business. The time that you spend with them varies. Mm. So the kind of interaction that my partner Seth had with Ben and Brian at AdMeld as that business started to grow, and then when Michael Barrett joined, mm. how that expanded, is different than the kind of time that my partner Ryan spends with Jim Franklin and the team at SendGrid. One's a mage and one's a ranger. That's right. Yeah, and, you're a... and the companies need different things. Right. So, you know, and then my partner Jason just invested in a company called Beta Brand. Mm. You know, the time that we would spend with, with Chris, who's the CEO, and the other, the other you know, early people at Beta Brand is totally different again. Mm -hmm. And different than the time that we might spend with John at Simpose, who's the CEO of Simpose, which is another company that's accelerating very quickly. So I think the issue is, it's not that there's a uniform set of activities mm. that an individual VC does. And it's not that each company needs the same sort of cookie, uh, a, a cookie cutter type thing. I think what's really valuable is to really focus hard on spending the most amount of time on the things that have impact on the company. When you said like, a lot of these VCs don't work that hard, and then some decide to work hard outside of your own partners, which I know you'd have to list first. So putting them aside, um, who, who, who are you thinking about when you said that, the VCs who work hard, that you well, really respect? I mean, Fred, Fred Wilson works incredibly hard. That's on the top of your you list. Know, yeah. I'm, I'm, and I'm, and Fred and I have known each other for a very long time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that... Uh, uh, what makes him so special? I mean, th I mean this is a guy who invested in some of the biggest companies the first time around, GeoCities, et cetera. Got his ass kicked a little bit on that whole mobile fund, but then came back yeah. in this new fund in Union Square after Flatiron and has absolutely crushed it. Well, Fred's, what is it? Fre Fred's, Fred's special a couple of ways, right? One is he's incredibly focused, and he and his partner Brad yeah. were very clear about what theme they were focusing on or what thesis they were focusing on when they started Union Square Ventures. And they, were, they made a series of investments that adhered to this thesis, which was the notion of the networked world and how that was going to play out. They were ahead of the curve. So they, they studied what they thought was going to happen rather than reacted mm. to what was happening in the moment. Right. And I think that's another mistake a lot of VCs make. All of a sudden, enterprise computing is, enterprise software is hot again. So everybody's, right. oh, we're enterprise software. Like, right. Well, like that was three years ago is when you should have been all focused on that. Like, yeah. Hey, Zendesk and Yammer are yeah, what, what's, already there. What's, what's the next wave? Right. So, so I think number one is, is he's very deep and very thoughtful. Two is he's very, very focused on what he wants to accomplish. So Flatiron could have, or uh, uh, Union, Square. Union Square could have raised much, much more money than they raised. Right. But instead he kept his funds relatively small. He keeps them in the two or three hundred million dollars. Two hundred million dollars. And he could raise two billion. He could be Andreessen and Horowitz. That's deliberate because Fred's view is the goal is not to invest in this huge number of companies and create this huge infrastructure and have lots and lots of people and continue to invest more and more capital. It's to focus on investing early in companies that are going to be transformational, super important companies. They don't come along that often, do they? They don't. And you don't get them right all the time. Right. And oftentimes when you get them right, you f them up. So, you know, and when I say you, I don't necessarily mean the investor. It could be the investor, the entrepreneur, yeah. the people around. So it's the kind of thing where by focusing right. and then by being true to yourself in terms of what you want to accomplish. And I think this is something that really starts to play out all the time. No criticism for what anybody wants to accomplish if they have a strategy. Fred has a strategy. His partner, Brad, has a strategy. Right. Lots and lots of people simply don't have a strategy. They don't have intent. They're just doing things in a reactionary Here's way. Here's what I am. I'm a venture capitalist. My job is to raise money for my LPs and invest in companies and do transformational investing. And it's a very simple job a VC has. People give you a dollar. Your job is to give them back three. And they give you another dollar. Your job is to give them back three or four or five. And it maybe on the, on the outlier, give them back 100. Well, not, not on a case-by-case -case basis, right. right? I mean, you know, the best venture fund in the history of man might be 20 times the money. Right, or 30 times the money on a net basis. But when basis. you're talking about LPs putting in $100 million or $20 million, those are big numbers. That's right. But somebody gives you $20 million. If you give them back on a net basis 60, they're incredibly happy. Right. If you give them back a net basis uh, 14, that wasn't very good. Yeah. But they love making those bets. It's like it, they know they're going to get back some percentage of it. Well... I mean, do, is it ever a wipeout for those LPs? There, you know, there have been a very few number of... Of venture wow. funds that were zeros, but how but, do you wind up with zero if you invested in fifteen things and you came out? 
Well, think about all the funds that invested in the bubble. There were yeah. a lot of funds that invested a lot of money in 1999 and 2000 that might return 10, 20, 30 cents on the dollar. Mm. And interestingly, you know, there's a few that return their capital. But the problem is, another, th that's another cycle of the problem, is that if you invest a, the same amount of money in every fund over the life of a venture firm as an LP, mm. you're in a much better place than if you invest different amounts in each fund. Right, this is back to the strategy yep. of, of, of time diversity effectively. Right. And the challenge is the opportunity for uh, uh, somebody like Union Square for Founder Group, we don't increase the size of our funds. So each fund is basically the same and the LP invests the same. So the time diversity happens by definition. Right. But if, you know, our first fund was $225 million and then three years later we raised a $500 million fund and then three years later we raised a billion dollar fund, right. all of a sudden we have different LPs in the mix and different amounts of money. You get into this thing where the timing starts to work against you and actually matters. Go back to where we said at the beginning, this is a long-term game. Some of these companies take 10, 15 years. I mean, uh, Fred and I are both investors in a company called Return Path. Right. Which is doing... God, that was the 90s, right? Extremely well. It was started in 1999. Wow. In 2012, it's a great company. But we're still investors. 13 years later. And we're going to make, you know, as, as investors, we will make a lot of money in it. What do your LPs think from 13 years ago when you're like, hey, by the way, you made some money? Do they forget? Well, it depends on how much. Ah. And it depends on the relationship with the LPs. Got it. In both of our cases, that particular fund, or the funds that invested early on, yeah. uh, one was Flatiron, one was Mobius. So yeah. in both of those cases, those LPs are just happy when we send them back more money. Right. And that's a nice extra. Because they're already in the black? It's a nice extra money. Yeah. Right? A little extra. In, in the case of, um, you know, something that is a 10-year uh, investment, but from an LP base that might be a 20 or 30 year LP base, they're probably gonna be fine with that. Yeah, interesting. And what do you think of Andreessen Horowitz just raising the stakes tremendously in the space, billions of dollars instantly, you know, 10 person marketing team, whatever it is. Some people feel they're going too big and it's, it's a little bit, I don't know, I don't wanna say the word spastic, but it's a little bit much, is what I, I've heard VCs say quietly, listen, this is a little over the top, it's too much. Are they threatened by Andreessen Horowitz or is Andreessen Horowitz just blowing the doors off this? Se two separate questions. Right. right. First question is, how is it doing? Yeah. The answer is, check back in a decade. Right. Like, really, check back in a decade. We'll see. I don't know. TBD. Right, and frankly, check back in 15 years. Right. Right. Um, does it threaten, uh, does that dynamic threaten VCs? Of course, it threatens a certain set of VCs. Um, I think that the set of VCs that it threatens, many of them behave in a way that you see that dynamic because they respond. So all of a sudden VCs have a marketing partner and all of a sudden VCs start doing different things to try to position themselves, right? There's a whole category of, I have to be better, different, whatever. Mm. And then there's a whole category of, I know what I do, I'm focused on what I'm doing, I'm just gonna do what I do. That intent again. That's just right. Doing and so, you know. With per a strategy. Personal opinion, I, I don't have, I don't know. I have no idea. Right, and yeah. it's great for you that there's somebody out there, and I, Brad and, and Mark and Dreesen are obviously brilliant guys. You can send one of your companies, send Griffey, go to them for their D round. I, I, I think it's awesome that people are trying different things, yeah. and I think that it's awesome that there's lots and lots of controversy around people trying different things. In terms you of, like that controversy. I love it. Of course. Yeah, I mean, that's that means it's something good. It's the essence of what's going on. I mean, innovation, you know, there, there is no static in this, right. right? And it doesn't matter where in the chain you're playing, whether it's as an angel investor or whether it's as, you know, a venture investor that's targeted on certain things or it's a venture investor who's trying to disrupt at the top end. I mean, he, here's an example of the phenomena where there's things that are the same that are different. Okay. Right? You know the cliche, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Right. Right? In two, Sometimes that's actually true. In 2007 and 2008 and 2009, all of a sudden you started hearing about uh, high velocity angel investors. And then it became being called super angels before they institutionalized. So then super angel became this thing that meant really micro VC. Right. But there's a period of time where angel investors were, we need to make a bunch of angel investments. Like the idea is, and in fact, Diversity. when you started making angel sure. investments, you picked up, I mean, you, you, you thought about it, you talked to people about it, and you realized yeah. pretty quickly, placing more small bets was better. Yes, than learned that from you. Than placing a few large bets, yeah. right? Well, when I look back at the angel investing that I was doing in the mid-90s, you know, in three years, I made 40 investments. Was that an innovation then? Not really. There were other people who had made many, many investments of relatively small amounts mm. in a concentrated way. So I think the issue is that things, 
things go through these phases where right. people are paying attention to something, all of a sudden, and this is one of the good things and the bad things about the media dynamic that we're dealing with in 2012, it's very easy to see what's happening. Right. There's a set of people who then try to turn it into a story, uh, and then you play the hero goat thing again. Right, and it's like, oh my God, Angel Gate, all oh, this, too many angel investors, there's right. a bubble. I mean, if there was a bubble right now and too many companies have been funded, and a- angels lose nine out of 10 investments, that's okay. That's how it's supposed to work. Well, two things. Yeah. An, an angel investor who's worried about losing, getting zeros on in investments shouldn't be an angel investor. Yeah. Right? Making, I mean, you, you want to you make... You should be a, a, a bond investor. You want to make 100 angel investments over your career. You want to have one of them that returns 100x. You're done. You're break even. Then everything else is playing with house money. Great. Whatever those numbers are. Uh, that's me. Okay. That, that's, that's, that happens that, to me. That's what you're trying to do. And yeah. then, you know, you have, again, intent, a strategy, whatever. The other dynamic, which is really important, is if you're the entrepreneur, who gives a Yeah. Like, if you're the entrepreneur, it doesn't matter whether there's too many companies or too few. It right. doesn't matter if there's too much money or too little. What does matter? What matters is that you are working with people that you want to work with on a product that you're obsessed with on doing something every day that you think matters. Back to product, back to team. You recently were in the Wall Street Journal as part of this new accelerator uh, thing. I read your piece, very thoughtful, about um, skill versus fit. Yep. Culture versus competence, I think is the way you said it. Explain the thesis. So uh, I believe very, very strongly, especially early in the life of a company, that you should always hire for cultural fit over competence. Okay. So if you draw a two-by-two matrix of yep. high, low, low, high, right? right, And, you know, there's a box in the corner that's high competence, high culture. Yes. You always hire that person. Of course. No brainer. Perfect. Low competence, low culture. Get you out. never hire that yeah. person. No. But how about the person that's high competence, low cultural fit? Hmm. That's a hard one. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's the jerk. You should never, ever hire that person. Don't hire ever. the highly competent jerk who rubs people the wrong way. For a couple of reasons, especially early in your Early company. on. Number one, he poisons everybody else. Ah. Number two, if he's in a senior role, he'll hire people that move the culture of the company in this uh, way that's Now you're getting ripped in half. Okay. You've yeah. seen this happen. All the time, over and over again. And when you How fa- do you tell the entrepreneur, hey, that person is not a cultural fit, even though they're doing their job? It seems like un-American in a way. It seems against everything that America stands for, which is if you're good at what you do, you get the job. Well, it's, it's actually super hard yeah. because the natural tendency is exactly what you just said. Interestingly, in a startup, it's not just functional competence that matters because the startup isn't, I have this hierarchy and everybody does their job and as long as they're doing their job, the machine moves forward and that's all right. good. That's not what a startup is. A startup is this messy thing where there's all these weird overlaps and people have to pick up the slack for other people and they have to handle all kinds Much of more weird ambiguity. It's like being lost in the, in the forest or something. Right. It's, it's different than just working in and a factory. There's a difference between culture and style. Okay, let's hear okay. that. So culture is your shared values. Okay. As an organization, and what's important to you. Okay. We are a design-driven company okay. where um, we work hard. We, work, we tran- have life balance. We're transparent. Okay. We're transparent. We always fulfill our commitments. People are always okay. on time to meetings. Like there can be little trivial things. There can be blo- broad, high flute, Super things. helpful, positive, okay. whatever. Yeah. Then you have people. Some people are extroverts. Some people are introverts. Some people like to sit in front of their screen all day. Some people like to talk. Some people like to you know, have their headphones on and be left alone. Other people like to be in a noisy environment. Got that's it. okay. That's not what I mean by culture. Right. Right. You can have people who have a really positive demeanor and other people who have a really grumpy demeanor. Right. That's okay. That's not culture. That's style. That's style. So separate between those two. Then this is the interesting one that's really powerful. If you have people that are high on the culture curve mm. and not low on competence. Yeah, not incompetent. Not incompetent. But mid competent. But, but mid competent. Those people are worth taking a risk on. I so agree with you. If, two things. One, you believe that they will stretch into competence. Right. Or you can redefine the role Hmm. so that they're into that high competence box. The best people I've ever had, and you know, this this is why I love reading your stuff, is you exactly describe something I always knew but had never been able to verbalize or even imagine, which is the people I look back on who had the biggest impact on my companies did not have the skills I needed at that time, but they liked to create and they had my sensibility, which mm-hmm. I think in a way, culture at a company is the founder or Absolutely. founders, right? Absolutely. Like, and mine was always no work hard, 
you know, transparent and like just face the truth and we're warriors together and, and, and a, maybe a little harsh, maybe a little hardcore. No, no, you're you're defined. I mean, those words are right. what I mean when I say culture. Right. Right. And you're exactly right. The culture comes from the founders. Right. And one of the brilliant things about being an entrepreneur is you get to define your own culture. You get to define right. what the define thing is. Define your world. That's right. And some don't do it. Well, some, they, let, they let the people do it around them. Some are afraid to do it. Uh. Okay. Some are... Some get worn down because they hire too many people that don't fit with their values, oh, and now all of a sudden God, you're in an unwinding an that sucks. That's right. And so you know, I've had to unwind that. This this comes back to the other Recently. side of it. When you realize, right? You realize you have people who don't fit. Oh, get out! It's just so hard. Just deal with it. You have to grow a pair and just get rid of them. It, it, you know what? And it's such a hard conversation to have with people and say, like, we got to get rid of this person because they don't fit culture. It just flies in the face of what... Well, it's natural instincts. The person's doing their job. You know, I can fix them. Think about a relationship. Forget about business for a second. Yeah, let's talk about love. Think about a relationship. Yeah. You're in a relationship. And your value systems are different. I, I, I married my high school sweetheart. Right. Okay. Um, it was good for like three days. <laughs> um, you know, when you're walking alone on Honeymoon Beach... Uh, on your honeymoon. Uh oh, <laughs> they call it honeymoon beach. You know, <laughs> wait a second, time out. Not, not alone. Something, beach. Not, something not good not here. Solo beach. Um, and that was your first wife. <laughs> yeah, my first wife. Not Amy. Amy and I've been together now twenty years. So that was that. that Apologies was a, to the first wife. That was a that was a short that was a, a short a mistaken sojourn. It was a failed first relationship. I was yeah. we were both young. Yeah, it happens. We didn't have kids, so it was more like a, a college breakup than anything else. Yeah. Uh, with with a little bit of trauma in it, but it was interesting when I look back on it. I my idea of a good time is to be at home at 10 o'clock right. and be laying in bed with a book. And maybe running a marathon the next day. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I go to bed at 10, I get up at 5 in the morning, and I'm not all about you know, uh, 1 o'clock in the morning smoking at the bar. Right. This is not me. I've right. never been like that. Yeah. And you know, she was much more... You know, she enjoyed yeah. that. She wanted to be out. You know, the yeah. idea that she was hanging around uh, on Friday night at 10 o'clock was right. antithetical to her worldview. Just simple example, but take that into the mix, right. right? What happens over time? Do you think, well, you think, well, I'll change that person. Like yeah, I'll change luck. her so she likes to stay home at 10 or she'll change me. So all of a sudden I magically like yeah. to go out and stay and out to one And that usually results in? Not, not goodness. Result, resentment. <laughs> right? Yeah. Anger, well, frustration. Well, how many women marry a guy? I mean, it's, it's so stereotypical, but I saw growing up Irish, like these women marry these drunks and then they say, oh, I can, I'll get them off the sauce. And Never. I've heard that so many times from the Irish girls sure. I grew up with. It was like, yeah, how'd that work out for you? Right. So you got 5% chance, 2% chance or whatever. It's the same yeah. thing in the relationship. You're looking for somebody who will go on a journey with you. Right. In a business, you're looking for people who will go on a journey with you. And with an with investor, you. too, like you're saying. With an investor, you want somebody who's going to go on a journey with you. You're the CEO. Hmm. If I, as the investor, and this is a deeply held belief that we have at Foundry, Foundry Group and that I have myself, if the answer is, it's a great company, but I have to fire you because I need to bring in a CEO to make the company successful, right. I shouldn't have invested in the first place. Yeah. Okay, if I don't want to spend the weekend with you, if I don't want to go on a you know, this journey with you, forget it. That's right. And I want it both directions. I want, I know you're going to f*** up. I know you're going to make mistakes. I know you're going to have moments of crisis. I know you're going to have troubles. Sort of my angel investing thesis right. now too. Yeah. I, I, but I'm, 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 do I want to have dinner with you? I'm your guy. Yeah. And if it doesn't work and every now and then it really doesn't work. Right. Got to deal with it. Yeah. In terms of you in that role. Right. Every now and then. But our view and my view specifically is when you get to that point, usually you're probably already screwed up. Now, interestingly, remember Dun Dungeons and Dragons right. characters. VCs think differently. Yeah. Now, within my partnership, the four of us all think the same way. It's, a, it's a, as we say, deeply held belief. There are plenty of very, very successful VCs who don't think that way. Right. Who view it as, I need to focus on the business, right. and then I can replace the person if I need to. Yeah. I mean, and some people have gotten a bad rap for that and actually changed their position on it over the years. It does happen. You've seen a lot of bad behavior over the decades. Yes. What's the worst? I'm sure I've had some bad behavior. Over maybe, the maybe. Actually, in fact, I have a list of CEOs. <laughs> and here's a, let me just start at the top here. Uh, no. In 1997, you were late for a board meeting. Um, <laughs> what's the craziest bad behavior, without naming names, obviously, uh, what's the craziest bad behavior of a VC in relation to working on a board? Then we'll go to entrepreneur after that, that you saw in general terms. And um, don't give me the second one that's the safe one. Give me the one that's the unsafe one. The, the worst... The worst behavior, and I'll, I'll describe it as a pattern, okay. is um, essentially uh, the VC that is incredibly disruptive, disruptive because of their interaction with the company. 
Got so it. think about the. So you've been in this circumstance uh, over and over again. Think okay, about what's the worst. The only yeah. no, no, but the only time that the VC engages is at the board meeting. Oh. The only thing the VC does is criticize. Ugh. The only thing that the person does is sort of bloviate about what the right thing to do is. Ugh. And then they disappear again. And only they, to reemerge. To reemerge six weeks later, eight weeks later, and do the same thing again. And pound the table again. Yeah. And oh, I think, I think for me, that, that, that is the worst to deal with. Because almost everything else you can deal but with. But as a fellow VC, when you were in that meeting with that douche, who, who, who shall remain nameless, he or she... Um, what do you do as the other VC in the room? Do you take the person well, aside and say, douche? When I was younger, I couldn't do it, or I didn't feel comfortable Didn't have doing the cred. It, or just didn't feel comfortable with it. Right. Didn't really understand what was going on. Got it. Now, it's very obvious, and as an investor, I'll simply confront the person with it. In the meeting in or the meeting. post? In, no, the in the meeting. meeting. So I think that one of the things Do so you just say to somebody in the meeting, like, listen, guy. Cut the bullshit. Cut the bullshit. You haven't been here for three months. You, didn't, you haven't visited the company. If you want to help, and you think it's so bad, why aren't you here on a Tuesday helping them out? Not helpful. Correct. Right. That's right. So the other the other thing that I would wow, say... Wow, that's got to be fascinating in that meaning. Yeah, well, sometimes they're heated, but they're yeah. heated good because you either... One of two things happens, right? You either get to a better place... Right. Or you realize that you've just got a structural problem and you've got to deal with that structural problem. I had the same thing happen on one of the first boards I was ever on. This one VC would show up late. He was a really nice guy, but he would show up late and then talk about all his experiences from like the 80s that were not relevant, and, yeah. the and he would send the team on these wild goose chases, like, my wife thinks this, and I'm like, what does your wife have to do with this company and what right. they're trying to accomplish? Like, I mean, I love you, you're an interesting guy, but keep going. So I believe that most, uh, the, the, so the first book in this series, that's uh, Startup Communities, yeah. I have this series now that I'm doing, it's yeah. called Startup Revolution. Right. The second book is called Startup Life, mm -hmm. uh, Surviving and Thriving a Relationship with an Entrepreneur. Wow. So it'll be out in January. Amy, my wife Amy and I wrote it. Oh, wow. Um, the third book is called Startup Boards. Mm. And, and the subtitle is something like Making Your Board of Directors Relevant Again. Most venture-backed boards are an artifact of the last 30 years of behavior. Mm. So if you think about how a board works, it gives VCs and board members an excuse not to engage with the company. Right. I'll just be there at the board I'll meeting. Be, I'll be there at the board meeting. I'll wait till the board meeting. I'll get the board package a day before or maybe at the meeting. I'll yeah. read through it. I'll assign a bunch of tasks. It's I'll, a farce. And the company spends a day a month in advance preparing all this stuff. Two, weeks. two days, weeks. Yeah. And then there's a day or two of follow up <laughs> that you don't have to do. Versus, so basically every two months a week's lost. That's right. My view is that there's an approach which is essentially continuous engagement. Mm. And it's the same kind of model that's applied to software where it used to be that you release software every six months or every twelve months. Right. Right? right, and now you release every week or every other week. Of course, and so you have this process now—an agile process in the context of building software. Agile boards, continuous development agile is boards. the ultimate, right? So wow. think about an agile That's... board. Think about this idea of continuous development in the context of the board. Continuous engagement. You know, how many entrepreneurs out there have their VCs on the all at company.com list? I do. I and do. I have Matt, Coffin, and Rolf, both of them. Good. Both and, on it. And it's helpful because they understand the tempo of what's going on in the company. Yeah, they just read it, yeah. yeah. And I, was, I told Roloff, I was like, do you want to get these? Because like, sometimes it turns into a 20 message yeah, there's thread. Cup, there's cupcakes in the kitchen. There's, there's, no, it's all nonsense. It's, yeah. You hit archive, or if you're in Gmail, well, you hit mute, it goes away. You don't worry about it. And well, yeah, and it's all in, the, uh, all in the folder. You said I have it in a folder, I'd read it at night, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So it's this notion of continuous involvement so that when you mm. email me with something, I have current information. Interesting. When you need to talk about something or you have a crisis or something changes it's in the not, company. It's not, I don't want to catch you up so much. That's right. The other problem with board meetings and the other problem with, with uh, uh, investors in the context of this is that it's all looking in the rearview mirror. Think about the board meetings where 80% of the board meeting is reporting. And it's all BS reporting. You, you anyway. trot up, you know, the PowerPoint slides hey, everything's and, this, going to the and right. this and that and yeah. this financials. Like, I can read. Yeah. Like, I can read a financial statement. Just send yeah, it Flip to the me. classroom. In fact, take the financial statements out of the board package. Mm. I want the financial statements once a month because yeah. you report once a month. Just send it to me on the 15th of the month. Right, we're done. And I'll look at it. We don't have to talk about it in the board meeting unless there's something specific going on that we need to yeah, talk financing, about. financing. So whatever. then you spend your meetings. The best board meetings I've ever been in are what I call one-slide board meetings. Okay? No PowerPoint. No PowerPoint. One slide. One slide. It doesn't even have to be a slide. Whiteboard. Bullet points right. of topics we're going to talk about. Now, you could have given me a board package in advance to read. It could be 100 pages. It could be 10 pages. I don't care. Right. You give me whatever I need. If I have continuous involvement with you, right. you now have the board's undivided attention 
in a room for three hours, four hours. Go deep, deep. on the stuff that you really got to deal with. Mm. Interesting. All right, we talked about bad behavior of VCs. Let's talk bad. Oh, the, you know, the other thing, people do lie. And it's useful to know that. Mm. And it's very easy to forget that. People lie and cheat. It's hard for people like us to think of that because I'm, I'm assuming you're not, I mean, I know you for a long time. I know you're not the type of guy who would ever lie or cheat because yeah. you don't have to. I, I don't have to. I'm not sure I really understand what it means. What, why? I, this is something I don't understand. I watch people go to jail. Bernie Madoff or who's the dumbass with the ex, the, the, the Indian guy yeah, who yeah, just yeah. went to jail yeah, for insider trade. Oh, no, no. The, uh, the uh, uh, McKinsey guy. Well, no, 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 no. The guy, yeah, there was a guy who was running some Galilean fund yeah, and yeah, he was getting yeah. expert information yeah, from other guys. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you're worth billions of dollars. You're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And you're trying to make an extra $10 million on some trade or a million dollars on some trade with some inside information on Dell shares. Are you deranged? You it's, risk it all? And, and what, what is it? What it is is it's ego. Is it? And absolutely. Here's a good one. Have you read Tyler Hamilton's book about the Lance Armstrong and the doping thing? I have not. Unbelievable book. This, this book just came out, whatever, three months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've heard Unbelievable book. So for, you know, I'm not a cyclist. I'm not a big cycling fan. Mm -hmm. I get sort of sucked into it a little bit because right. of Boulder and because all my friends are into it. You know, for 15 years, 10 years, whatever it is, there's been this huge you know, mythology around cycling mm. and, you know, this very clear Lance Armstrong saying, I don't do this, I don't do this, right, I don't right. do this. And it's all utter Yeah. Right? And not only is it utter it's such a good object lesson of when somebody could have stood up and said, look, everybody's doing this, including me, let's stop right now. And we'll all start and, and, and it would have been fine versus this perpetuating this lie. Oh, and it's, it's all ego. So that plays out over and over again. And so you hear it over and over again in the context of people who are trying to create whatever their view of reality is that doesn't necessarily link to the actual reality. Mm. Right? They're trying to tell some story that's just not reality. And then they start, they can't stop. And, and you have this over and over and over again in the context of VCs and VCs interaction with entrepreneurs and interaction with companies. Uh. And it's one of these things that's fascinating because a lot of it's about scorekeeping right? How well did we do on this mm -hmm. or how well did we do on that? But that's not where it's nefarious. Who cares? That's just gymnastics. Right. W where it's really difficult is when somebody says something and the entrepreneur hears it as either a command or substantive fact that they incorporate into their worldview. Right. And then you hear that repeated over and over again. And all of a sudden that becomes influence on behavior within a company. Ugh. And I've had situations where, you know, where I, where I think about it, where one of the investors essentially used this, their own sort of morphed, weirded up worldview, mm. weren't clear with why. Right. And a lot of times it's different things. Motivation. Um, I need this company to exit so I can raise my next fund. So now's really a good time for so us to sell BC the company. So a would pressure or lie to or manipulate a CEO to sell their company in order to close the next fund? Correct. But that, that's absolutely true, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. But it's not that they could manipulate the entrepreneur to do it. It's that they would put pressure on the entrepreneur. If the VC simply said, look, it would be really helpful to me if we could get an exit for me in the near term, because this is going to have a really meaningful impact on my fundraising. Mm. That's so much of a different conversation yeah. than, you know, I'm really worried about your future performance and the competitive dynamics. And we got to get out know, now. We got to sell this company a high now. Risk now yeah. Right. Th those two things are, are those lies. I don't know, but um, just the, the way you deliver the information is so different. Mm. The entrepreneur has so much pressure already. Right. So how is the board ever going to put extra pressure on this manic thing of founding companies? I mean, but they do it all the time oh. in, in this context of what you need for yourself versus simply saying, this is what I need. This is yeah. what, this is what my well, pressures yeah, I've are. I've only ever had one VC it was roll up both. And you know, it's, it's like, that's like you, it's like, it's like marrying, you know, Marilyn Monroe or whoever the perfect woman is. It's like, he's the perfect VC. He, everything he does has been so delightful. You know, it's like, you want to sell the company? We could sell the company. You want to raise more money? We'll raise more money. You want us to raise, you want us to put more money in the B round? We'll put more money in. You want us to put in less? We'll put in less. I mean, some folks are just class acts like that. I think so. I think, and I, I again, it comes to Dungeons and Dragons characters, uh, right? right? So you have some of that. Pick wisely. You have, you have and, and really make sure you know what you're getting. Mm. And recognize that what you're getting, just like all human beings, what you're getting today, there's a lot of it that's going to stay consistent over a long period of time but there's some of it that changes, hmm. right? We're all mortal. We all die. Right. 
you know, we die. Uh, I, great quotes. A friend of mine told my wife the other day, we all die in no particular order. Hmm. Right? Okay. Yeah. So what matters between now and the moment that the lights go out? Right. And depending on what happens in people's lives, different things matter. Right. And so recognize that as an entrepreneur because you're going to get those kinds of variations over time. And understanding that, oh, by the way, you as the entrepreneur are going to have those changes. Right. You had a kid, your priorities change. Yeah, you get married, your priorities change. You have yeah. a kid, your priorities change. Your business has a downturn. You have different pressures and you haven't dealt with a particular type of pressure before. The way you relate to it changes some. All of a sudden, some things work differently in a different place that's unexpected. You have trouble with a partner that you've been partners with for a decade. Like, all of these things can happen. Should all these founders have coaches, do you think? Should that be like a mandatory thing? You get venture capital, you got to have Jerry Colonna as a coach or something? I think if you can get Jerry Colonna as a co coach, it's a blessing. Right. Um, I just talked to Jerry Colonna's famous venture capitalist that you worked yeah. with at, uh, well, he was at Flatiron. He was Island, Fred's partner Fred in, in their first one. But, uh, man, he's had a tremendous impact. It, it, there's not enough coaching for CEOs. I find the CEOs are all, because I've been doing the angel investing, and I guess they see me less as an angel, more as a fellow entrepreneur. It is lonely yes. and brutal. So this is something we've worked really, really hard at at Techstars, and it, it fits into a couple of different categories. The first is the peer relationships between CEOs. Mm. So, and it's, it's just true, even in my first company, um, I got to a point in my first company where we were about a dozen people, I'd never fired anybody, Ugh. I went away for... How bad is that the first time you fired someone? It was really Your leg shaking under the desk? Well... Uh, Sweating? Way worse than that. Yeah. So, Puking? So the, the first... The fir the, here's, here's, here's a short arc of the yeah. story. I'm probably 23, 24. I've never fired anybody because I never worked for anybody. So this was... Yeah, it's not possible. Right? right? And so we got 12 people. We got one of the 12 people who clearly doesn't fit. She doesn't fit culturally and she's incompetent. Ugh. Okay? I go away to a thing called Birthing of Giants. Hmm. What it is is it's a weekend retreat that Inc. Magazine put on. Yeah. It was 60 entrepreneurs... Uh, under the age of 40 mm. that had started companies that had a million or more in revenue. So you were the youngest? Okay. I, was one of the, I was one of the youngest and one of the smallest companies. Right. Uh, Ted Leonsis was there wow. when he had Redgate Communications sure. before AOL bought it. Uh, Tim DeMello, who went off to do a bunch of other things, did a guy, Mark Cohen, who did Daymark. Remember the yeah. Daymark catalogs? Of course. He was there that weekend or that, for that event. And I made many, many friends that I've had lifelong friends through this. It was a combination of Young Entrepreneurs Organization, Inc. Magazine, and mm. a guy, Vern Harnish, who's yeah. uh, been extraordinary in a number of different places with entrepreneurship. And I spent four days with my peers. It's the first time I found my peers, mm. right? I'd never really known any other entrepreneurs. Right. Boston in 1990, and I've got a partner. And yeah, yeah there's nobody there. I mean, they're, you know, I'm a Jewish guy, so I get stuck in this Jewish software <laughs> box. Like, I can't yeah. find... All of a sudden, I got 59 peers. Right. And my obsessive thing is I got to fire this person. I came back the next week. I agonized over it for another week, but I knew I had to fire this person. Yeah. I was going to fire her Monday morning first thing. I prepared my speech. Yep. Uh, I spent all weekend. I couldn't sleep. I got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, which is an St hour earlier than I usually get up. Right, right. Staring at the ceiling. Yeah, just totally, and I, I come to the office. At, I get to the office at like 7 and, you know, she always shows up at 9.15 or 9.30. Yeah, yeah. And 10 o'clock comes, 11 o'clock comes. And this is before email. This is 1990. Yeah. You're like, what's going on? I get a phone call. I get a message from our receptionist that uh, this woman's not coming in today because she got hung up at something or other. So, like, all of the angst, I have to Ugh. wait another day to fire her. <laughs> so the next day, she comes in about 9.15, 9.30. And, I, and I'm... You're ready to go. I'm ready to go. You, I give her my talk, you know, my 15-second, 30-second prepared speech. And she looks at me and she says, you know, I think it's uh, the employer's fault when the employee doesn't work out. Uh -huh. And she picked up her stuff and she left. She'd clearly been fired before. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, oh, okay, that's right. done. So I convene the whole company, the remaining 11 yeah. of us. We go in the conference room and I say, I give this speech that I also prepared. Right. And you know, family, the uh, stuff. And I look around the room and everybody's quiet. And then uh, this woman, Bonnie, who's one of our software engineers, who was just brilliant. She looks up and she says, can I have her chair? No, right? and you realize and like, like, to you, this is the most important yeah. thing in the world, and to everybody else, yeah, they really it, want it, that area totally chair. <laughs> but, but, but piece number one was um, uh, finding my peer group. Right. Piece number two, which we've worked really hard at with Techstars, is mentorship. And this right. idea of having experienced entrepreneurs working with first-time entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs who are on their journey going through this new company, where the experienced entrepreneurs are not acting as advisors. They're not saying, give me this and I'll help you with this. Right. They're also not telling you what to do. Right. 
They're mentors. They're coaches. They're helping you understand what their experiences are. They're giving you data. They're a resource for you to talk to. Yeah. And that phenomena is so powerful. And even in the absence of the relatively few amazing mm. coaches like Jerry Colonna, right. of which there are a few, right. and there's a large number of... 98% douche. Right? Yeah. But there's a few like Jerry that are just amazing. Outstanding. Those mentors who are experienced entrepreneurs play an incredible role, especially mm. for not just first-time entrepreneurs, but other experienced entrepreneurs, because you're right, it's incredibly lonely. Yeah. And in that moment of loneliness, yeah, you can talk to your significant other, your partner. You, can, uh, you don't want to burden them. Right. You don't. Right. What you want is you want somebody that you can go have a beer with, or you want somebody you can go for a walk with, or you right. want somebody that you can... A little can, walk and talk, as you we can, say. You, know, you can sit down and have a meal with. We can't, in most cases, you, you tell your VCs it's a sign of weakness. You tell your employees, you rattle them, they're distracted. I mean, you're just in this weird space where, like, you don't want to burden the spouse, you can't burden the VCs, or you don't want to appear That's weak, right. can't burden and distract the employees. The peer and the mentor are so powerful, and for, you know... Every entrepreneur I've ever interacted with, you know, there's lots of ways to do it informally and formally. Yeah. Put it, you know, you have a board of directors. Make sure that if you're a CEO, one of the people on your board is a CEO. Yeah, absolutely. Who is a peer of yours. Right. Who can be a resource for you that sees what's going on. And an advocate, too, on. on the board, too. Right? Like, not every VC is going to call out another VC who's doing that douche That's right. move, you know. That's right. That you described before. So I, I think that that dynamic around coaching is... Finding a special person who plays that role if you're uh, a CEO is is magical. Yeah. But in the absence of that, don't forget to have the mentors and yeah. the peers who you have those relationships with. On that, uh, Brad Feld, everybody uh, go buy the book right now, Startup Communities, uh, Building an Entrepreneurial Ecosystem in Your City. Um, and your, is it Feld.com? You're Feld.com. Feld.com. Feld Feld so easy. And you're B Feld on Twitter, right? B Feld on Twitter. At B Feld. Everybody follow uh, B Feld. And uh, listen, Boulder is a great place to start your uh, company. So if you are thinking about it, TechStars is amazing. Everybody knows Brad at Feld.com. He's super accessible. Read his blog at Feld.com. I read it. It's extraordinary. And uh, thank you to my friends at Igloo for um, sponsoring independent media like this week and startups. Couldn't do it without you guys. What a great inter the intranet company. You're not going to hate. Uh, it's really great. E-Minutes, thank you for supporting entrepreneurs. It's so great to have people uh, sponsor the program uh, who I can tell you use their services or products or just thank them on Twitter. Because we only accept people when uh, we use the product ourselves, and, and, and we really uh, get behind the endorsement there. We, we're sold out for four or five months in advance, but we only take products we like, like Sangrid or Mailjamp or whoever, go to meeting. And uh, anything to plug? You got any plugs? Nothing to plug? You, you know, get something coming up? I think, when is I, the next I, think I, I think this week in startups is awesome. Oh, thank I think you. people should, oh, wait, that's self-referential, right? We're yeah, off. I think you just exploded the internet. Oh, damn it. You just retweet yourself on the show. <laughs> I just, today, I did something. That's called the, master tweeting. I did the, yeah, it is. I did <laughs> the ultimate douche move today. I saw one of my own tweets on my phone, and I favorited it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I was like, wait a second, you can't favorite your own awesome. tweet. That's wait. so douchey. Yeah. But I was like, my just initial reaction was, that's, that's a, a good that's tweet. That's a good tweet. I hit favorite. <laughs> and then I immediately was like, oh my God, I favorited my own tweet. Somebody's going to see that. It's going to confirm exactly what an egomaniac I am. And I un unfavorited it immediately. Um, but yeah, really great to have you on the program. Awesome. It's, to be I mean, I, it's an hour and 20 minute discussion. We could talk for two hours and 20 minutes. We'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. <laughs>